Mapa is uh, a big data platform initially based on Hadoop, and we had more and more stuff to do with uh, real-time data and SQL database. And uh, as you can see, previously I worked in different uh, software models, mostly in the database side, from uh, Coachbase, MongoDB, Oracle, or Java uh, I do less uh, web development app, it's purely data processing and uh, data transformation. Previously, we were in Coachbase on Java, and Oracle was working a lot on the web application of Java. So, today in this presentation, I will talk about different things, is why we talk about uh, data in motorsport, and after, based on a small demonstration, to demonstrate why it could be interesting. Uh, I will describe the architecture. The architecture being the big data kind of stuff. How do you deal with capture the data? How do you analyze the data? What you can do with it? And the type of you know, open source you can uh, work with. So, as part of this, I'll just take the one second. Yeah, not better. So, so why it's interesting in Formula One or any motorsport? It's because of this. You see in the paddock, uh, you have many engineers looking at many, many screens. All the screen, most of the time, showing some data about whatever in the, in the ways, in the car, and so on. And if you look a little bit on the internet, and I put some uh, URL on the, on the side of the slide, so you can find where this data are coming from, uh, all the software will give you many information uh, about the cars and the way, so you have different cars with a RPM or speed, the way they use brake or photo and these kind of things when they, they capture the data. And it's very interesting to use this data in real time, but also for analytics after the fact. So if you see two different cars based on, uh, on the speed, you see the way of the, the blue uh, cars with a different speed on different way of where they break, where do they put more power on how fast they will go in different place. So you really it's either based on time or distance, depending on how you want to look at it. And you have many, many sensors, so you can also, for example, look at how the brake of the throttle uh, uh, are used when they drive the car. And the input are used for many, many, many things. Uh, to do predictive analysis about how the car behaves, the tires, the engine, the, anything you can break, and so on. And <coughs> the goal for this is, for example, to work on, uh, anal do an analysis in real time about how much fuel you consume, and what will be the prediction for the car, how much tire you will uh, destroy, and so on. But obviously, you can also inject some interesting information about, you know that where the tire is getting older, the car will be slower, at least it will not drive as, as good as before. When you, have, when you have less fuel, you have a lighter car, so it's fast. So all this you calculate, you can analyze in real time or uh, in batch mode. And you can add many, many information like uh, who are the other cars, how do they behave, the weather conditions, the weather predictions, the goal being to take some uh, strategy during the race and do that also uh, during uh, uh, to make some calculation to improve the car or improve the driver uh, behavior on a specific track. I am not a big fan of motorsport, but if you I'm doing I love sailing, if you look at the America's Cup, America's Cup will be almost the same in terms of data they have to capture on what they do in terms of analysis. Uh, so when you have all this data, you can do many things like marketing things about live, live uh, streaming of information, games, and so on. You can find some public data. Uh, remember I put the links here? These are uh, buttons during the Australian Grand Prix uh, 2014, I think they put and all the data publicly on a Google spreadsheet. So you have many, many uh, big CSV files with many important information. So you can play. This is a blog post about what the guy has done with the data. He has many, many information on where they are, how much speed, how much uh, gravity or uh, G-force they were using. 
But let's talk about the data themselves. How much data really you have to deal with in Formula One? And, and I, I took the example of Formula One because you find cubic data. Right. So on a car, you can have up to 300 sensors. And when you have many sensors in the uh, in uh, in the steering wheels, but you have it for each brake, in each tire, in many places in the engine, many 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 things. So up to 300 sensors. I mean, you want to communicate quickly with uh, the paddock in real time. So you have many channels, high frequency channels to send the data. Obviously, it's way always that you can get it to the cable connected to the car. And uh, so it has to be very, very fast. Because even if the car doesn't react alone, it doesn't change the configuration itself. It's not allowed. You could, but it, technically you could, but it's not allowed by the federation. They have to send the data as fast as possible to the paddock, like that the engineers can say to, can talk to the driver saying change the specific way in the way you drive because you are burning too much fire or so burning too much fuel. So they will send the data as fast as possible. Most of the time it's two milliseconds or less from the paddock, from the track to the paddock. If you look at one ways, you have more than 1.5 billion data points sent over during the race. So over the weekend, if you take the test on the Friday, Saturday, and so on, you have five million uh, entries that you have to capture. For one car, for one for 90 minutes, it's around five to six gigabytes of data, and it's compressed on its own binary format. It's a very very optimized format because you have to send the data from the car uh, over a high fire. Wi-Fi connection, so uh, this is a very compressed, optimized format. But if you look at it globally, when you take all the data on all the cars from all the team during the weekend, it's 240 terabytes of data. So the thing is, it's a huge. I don't know if some people Google may see it's small, but for me at least, it's a big set of data. Um, the idea is how do you deal with the goal is how do you deal with this data? And you have multiple challenges. You want to capture that in real time to give them to the team. But you also want to capture and keep that as long as possible to do all the analytics you want, to do all the machine learning you want. The more data you have, if you can keep them and analyze them, better will be the work you can do with them after. So how do you capture your store and so on? So what will be the challenge is how to do deal with this in real time. So globally, the architecture you will see, and, and uh, it's based on the discussion we have as LAPA, as a company. We work with, uh, uh, we are currently trying to sell our solution, it's not a done deal yet, with a, a, a Formula One uh, team. And more or less, the architecture will look like that, except this product is not yet in the paddock, but, uh, you have the car sending data over half link to uh, the main hub from the, uh, uh, the federation of racing. Then it sends data to two different teams, and you have different consumers of that. The, what is important, you see cars producing data. You may have some proxies in the middle to deal with security, to uh, organize the data, but more importantly, you have many consumers. Consumers of the data will be in real time, the engineer teams inside the panel will look at the things. But you also want to be able to do some analytics in real time. But all the data, you want to keep them to send them to the factory, directly from the race or just after the fact, to be able to do lots of, lots of work about analytics, capturing the data, work with some optimization to understand the cars and the car behavior to improve from uh, day after day the cars. The demo that I will show you in a minute, it's a simplified version of this. It's a racing car that is in my bag, a smaller uh, simulator of the car that will send data into a streaming technology, and we'll come back to this in a minute. And I have two consumers, one just to show data in real time in a dashboard, and capture data into a database that is a lot of SQL database, and access it using SQL. Just to show kind of an architecture to work with this. What is interesting to understand in terms of global architecture that you can 
see many, many, many contexts. Uh, we can sometimes talk about the lambda architecture, which you have one side of it that is batch oriented, which on the also all the events. Because it's one you never did it kind of. You will spend everything, everything, everything to do some analytics, some transformations. And if you want to go back in time or to do a new way of processing the data, you can because you have everything. Or the other side will be the fast layer where you deal with the data in real time. In this case, I don't really have any storage because I just want to do a dashboard, but you can imagine to have a SQL engine and elastic search depending on what you want. So the demo is based on a, on a very interesting uh, software that's called Tox. It's, uh, it's an open source racing car simulator of the Tox, the open source racing car simulator. Uh, it's a kind of, I think it's from 2007, so the, 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 the quality of the image is not that good, but it's an open source with an C on C++ working on many platforms, so you can expand it. And we use it just as a simulator to show what could be the information when you work with uh, cars, connected cars, in the context of the race. So let's, uh, let's do the, the demonstration. So I didn't have the time to test it yet. It's long, it's long. So let me share my screen. I won't try to change the resolution, so we will see on a small map. So this is a simulator. It stops, as you can see. And it's working in a So I have a website here connected to my sandbox, to my, um, where I have different charts that will show speed by time, speed by distance, speed by uh, RPM. As soon as the start, the race will start, uh, you, we should see some data. So you have many ways of configuring the data in talks. By default, I take a very simple race, seven cars, uh, default track, but you can configure the race to have more or less cars, different type of cars, and so on. And you can play with it also, not, not in uh, the way we are configuring, but you can, you can really play with it. So, if you see, you have the information, the red line is the information that is shown here on the dashboard, and you see the RPM, the speed, uh, the fuel, the throttle, the brakes, gravity, and so on, uh, g force. So, so everything you need about what you need, but everything is available on the UI. But you also have data streaming to the application. So we should see progress. So this is uh, speed by time. So I can remove, I, I use 3GS, D3GS just to show the, the graph. Uh, speed by, that, by distance. So this is zero, it's just before the start of line, first lap. Then now you are, it was the last uh, two <coughs> Then you have the starting line, and you see the car doing the different things. So in this context, what people will do in real life, they will compare either two cars behavior or the same cars between two laps to see how, how good it's uh, uh, why where the, uh, the car lost on time. And I've done the same with uh, RPM, so the speed of the engine and the, the race go on.
two consumers, one being the UI, so we just use WebSocket and our database. So if we look in detail, it's a Java application with Kafka, so Apache Kafka, we'll come back to that in a minute, something data into Mapper Spring, so it's a, it's a different implementation of Kafka. It's the same API, it doesn't use exactly the same to store the information. And then I have two Java API, two Java application running. One of them is just consuming the message and using a WebSocket to push that directly into the browser. So it's one consumer. I have a browser, so this one will be the fast layer. The batch layer is using the, car the same, another Kafka consumer, but using exactly the same data that you receive from the cars in, to save them into a database. And then I, when it's inside the database, I can build an application, I can use analytic tools, I can use many, many things. Here, just to, because I don't want to, I want to explain how, how we have done it, uh, we didn't change the cars to send data somewhere. What we have done in reality is all the cars are sending data into a log file. And we take the log into the Kafka. <coughs> it was very simple to modify talks to do that. Uh, instead of trying to, to really go into the car simulator or something like that. So, uh, but it simulates uh, uh, the cars running. So talking about the storage, here I'm talking about three things. I store some message here. I store some uh, uh, data in the database, or I could store that in other places. When we talk about big data, who has worked with Hadoop already? Few of them, or no, only few, okay. So, when we talk about Hadoop, you need to have data. So if you have 20 gigabytes of data, don't bother installing Hadoop, okay? Any database will work. If you work with Half a terabyte, one terabyte on this data set doesn't change. It's the same. It does, doesn't necessarily make sense to uh, have a, a cluster or any database will work. It's very interesting when you have a lot of data and you continue to add data. On the data are different formats and can evolve over time. I will give you an example about the formats channel on the data structure. Inside MAPA or Hadoop, you have different ways to store the data. You mainly have two ways. Either you choose to work to save the data in the file system, so you heard about HDFS, a new file system, or MapRFS, that's the equivalent, or into NoSQL database, because inside Hadoop you have HBase, or MapRDB, or MapRDB JSON. But this would be another NoSQL database, or any database, depending on what you want or where you want to save. You have to choose where do I put my data. And you put your data in one or the other, or sometimes in two, depending on how you want to access it. The file system is very efficient and, very, and great, very efficient in terms of access. If you have to scan, efficient in terms of storage. It's not expensive compared to the database. So for all the events you want to capture from the first race to 10 years of racing, when you have 240 terabyte of data every weekend plus all everything you do. If you don't touch the data all the time, you just use some analytics, you will probably put that here into a file system that is distributed, compressed, optimized. But if you want to interact, for example, testing some configurations, ways of changing some configuration, accessing directly to a specific value for a card, you will put that into a database, random access, real write uh, on specific attributes. So when, we talk, when I talk about uh, big data, most of the time, all the projects on which I'm working, you always have at least a file system. I'm working, for example, with uh, a telco company. We have 3 terabytes of data every day, and they want to keep the data for 10 years. So the raw data are stored as a CSV file, then a parquet file that is an optimized format for a loop in the file system. Because they like that, they have the 10 years of data, but when they do some calculations, after they have done some calculations, they will save the result into uh, HBase MapRDB to make some efficient calculation on access. So this is a big difference between working with a relational database or a simple or secret to the database to do interactive stuff. Because this, when you have one petabyte of data or half petabyte of data, you don't access all the data all the time. 
it's going to be put away scans when you need to. So in this specific example, I am only using the database on Kafka streams or mapper streams. I don't use the file system directly because I don't need to. So one important part in the title of the presentation is about how streaming can help Formula One motorsport. When we talk about streaming today, in terms of technology, very often we will hear about Kafka. So what is Kafka? Who has used Kafka? Nobody? Okay, two. So most of the technology that I'm presenting in detail, I believe, uh, as you know, it's my opinion, I believe it's interesting for you as a developer, as an architect, to spend a few hours on it, just to understand, to play with it. Not, I'm not telling you to do that on every project, it's just to see what it is and see why it could be interesting for you. <coughs> so, Kafka, it's an Apache project, it has been built by LinkedIn in 2011, and it's an open source project that is very, very active and successful. And it's, it's a simple distributed messaging system that has been made to scale. Uh, you, can, you can talk about RabbitMQ, you can talk about many other MQ technology. This is more or less the same goal initially, but the implementation is different, the way it's done is different, and it's very, very easy to deploy, and more importantly, it's very, very easy to scale. So, it's made to do message queues, it's to do to real time streaming, this is what I'm doing today. Uh, event sourcing, you may have heard about CQRS, event sourcing, Lambda architecture, where you want to capture all the events that are happening into an uh, application, so all the transactions inside the database, all the click on, the, on your uh, website, all the touch on your mobile application, and you want to capture all the events and store that. A very common way today from a Java-based architecture to do that is using Kafka. Uh, log analysis or log capture or change data capture. Change data capture is really listening to all the events most of the time from a relational database and capture what's happening. You have a new person that link the new transactions, an insert and update. You don't capture the data, you just capture the update uh, operation and you store that. With uh, Oracle, you have uh, Golden Gate, for example, to do that. An expensive plugin. Well, it's a plugin. Expensive, I don't need to do it. I don't need to say. So, uh, the concepts that are inside Kafka <coughs> and also in most of the messaging technology is when you want to send messages, you have to organize them. You organize them by topics. Topics is an important concept. And uh, the process, the application that sends and posts the message is called a producer. And uh, the process is a consumer are called consumer. So you have one or multiple topics where consumer producers send messages. So the cars are producing messaging that are pushed into a topic. And you have consumer, for example, the dashboard or uh, the database. In the context of Kafka, Kafka, sorry, it's you have multiple brokers that build a cluster. The brokers is where the message will be sent, saved, and then consumed. So the, 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 the reason why Kafka has been built to scale and how it has been built is uh, unsuccessful is because of this. The reason why it has to scale, remember, it was built by LinkedIn. Initially, on LinkedIn, had a big challenge that yeah, there are many, many front-end applications, mobile applications, websites, those, if all the services they have to deal with into a big company like LinkedIn. And at the bottom, there are all the consumers that could be the CRM, could be the analytics, the machine learning platform, the big data, the data warehouse, and so on. They have to send data from here to here. It was a nightmare. So they said, let's build our own broker or message-based architecture at LinkedIn scale. So this is why from day one, it was built for a very, very, very big deployment. It was not built for a small, fast thing, it was built for a very large, fast, and scalable solution. And for that, if you have one topic, for example, all the topics that you, uh, all people are clicking on your website, if you want to be sure that it's scale, because the message, when they are there on the workers, they are saved on disk as a list of events. You see the first event, second event, and so on. Uh, if you want to be able to scale, you need to be able to be sure you can parallelize, you can partition the right. So the way you do inside a topic in Kafka, you will say, I want to use 
three partitions. On the consumer or the producer will organize to say, okay, I will write only on this or read only on this when I send this type of message. This guy will do the opposite, the opposite on, on another partition. Like that, you can add as many as you want. So you distribute the write when you distribute the read. This is how it's easy to scale. So the consumer will be organized differently. Is you have to be able to read also very, very quickly. And you have, if you have many applications that have to read millions of messages per second from this multiple or single partition, it's not efficient. So what you do, you create multiple consumers and you say they are in the same group. And they will, they will organize that by partition, so they will be efficient in a way also. So this is why it's very easy to scale. So when, when I say it's easy to scale, is when we do our testing, we bench and we push to the limit to 11, 12, 13 million messages per second, I don't three or five months cluster, just to be sure it's scale. Not everybody needs that, okay? Even if you are in a small configuration where you have a few amount of messages every second, it's still interesting to use Kafka because it's a very open platform with many connectors from many, many, many uh, tools. Uh, if you have something works perfectly with that it's working perfectly with Rabbit MQ or Active MQ, you don't have to change. But if you have not yet started to build a message queue like that, so a streaming technology, I would start with Kafka today. So the global architecture will be producer and consumer. In detail, this is my cluster. So this is my application, producing and consuming. <coughs> And you have in the middle multiple brokers. Each broker in Kafka is one Java. It's a Java process that you start. And it's controlled by Zookeeper. Zookeeper, Apache Zookeeper, it's one of the components initially built for Hadoop. To be sure, when you have many processes running together, it's, it's, it's checking that everything is working and organize where the data have to go. For example, Zookeeper, if this stuff dies, we'll be sure that People are going to the other uh, brokers and keeping the state of where are the last message and so on. So depending on the complexity of your application, you may have multiple multiple uh, Kafka clusters. It depends on the, how you want to deploy. Mapper strings. The goal of Mapper as a, as a way we build our platform is to make it very easy to install, manage, and scale, but using the same API. So, you can deploy Apache Kafka on Mapa. We choose to also change the persistence layer. We change this layer to make it easier to install, scale, and so on. So it's used the same API. So the code that I will show you, even if the messages are sent into Mapper screens, it will work exactly the same way on Apache Kafka. And it's just, it doesn't work with the same worker architecture. So if we go back to this schema, this is Kafka, you see, so keep a multiple process. This is not a string, you don't have to keep it anymore. The strings are specific locations on format on the distributed file system. So automatically, you leverage the power of mapper in terms of distribution, scalability, multi data center, uh, because in some case, it's complex to do with Kafka from one data center to another, you have to have new processes. If we go back to the example of the Formula One, with this architecture, what you can do, you have the cars sending data into a broker, into a stream, and you will have multiple consumers, real-time analytics locally, and you can have a replication that will push the data directly in the main data center in the headquarters of the team, where here they will do all the batch analytics. And the good part about the way it's built this link between the two data centers, even if it's not active, is okay. As soon as you have the connection, it will start to stream the data and replicate the data. So just a, a different architecture. So go back, going back to the data, in the demonstration, I choose to use JSON instead of using a binary complex format, uh, just to make it easy for everybody, starting with me. You can read quickly. Uh, so but, but I did something that is more or less close to the real no, more or less close to the reality. I buffer buff also information. What I mean by that is each second you have a message that is 
some or each two seconds, you have a message that is sent from the card to the broker, to the big uh, data platform. But inside, you have many data points. You see, it's record, it's one data point, another data point. In this specific version, you have the speed, the distance, and the RPM, plus the time, and so on. And the benefits of using a big data and no SQL platform, you can easily change the format of the data that you are manipulating. So for example, in the next version, you can add the clear throttle. So in this case, I have the here at a specific time. And this is why, independently of the volume of the data, it's usually better when you know that you deal with uh, data that will, you will keep long time, uh, during a very long time, and will add new features to your application. <coughs> it's very smart to use a file system or a NoSQL database because you can change that independently. And it's only the consumer that will pay attention to the schema. So it's all, all the flexibility about your data. When I was, before working at MAPA, when I was working at Cloudtrace on MongoDB, so pure NoSQL engine, it was not direct only big only data. You had many small applications with 1,000 documents, for example. So the volume and the scalability is not an issue. But still, it's very, very interesting to work with a NoSQL database because you have the flexibility of the skill. It makes you more efficient as a developer to adapt to change to the marketing team. In this case, it's to adapt to change new sensors into the car. So the demonstration that I have showed you is based on an Apache license, so if you want to test play with it. Uh, it's really limited in terms of data you capture. We could imagine if you find a, another game, for example, my dream will be to be able to capture the, the, the stream from a Microsoft Forza. Uh, I have an Xbox at home, so to, to capture the data from a better game or modern game energy uh, capture and stuff. Um, I use JSON for uh, simplicity, as I said. Before, uh, so I have many ideas when I will share that with you about how this application could evolve, but also how it could help a real, uh, a real team. But before that, I want to show you uh, some code about how it works. Uh, internally, and how simple it is, kind of. Also, so uh, as part of the as part of the architecture, you see, I put here the database. This database is my RDB. It's on my distributed file system. I am a file system on my cluster. You can read it. And here I have multiple tables. Uh, the way I organize for, for simplicity, I have a, I have a whole car. If I look at it, you see it's a map of Tigo. It's like HBase, but in this case, it's map of the JSON. We use a JSON database that we have in our platform to make it easy. So, multiple tables, one of them is capturing all the events. Because I develop multiple consumer, I also for uh, to make the life easier. Multiple uh, one table for each element, just uh, uh, as an example. The way it's stored inside the database, it's using a JSON format. It's using a JSON document. So if I do a query, uh, this is a MapRDB query uh, shell. It will find in this specific table with this specific ID, being the value. And my document is stored, is stored here. So you see I have somewhere the wrong document with all the sensors, but it's one single document with many, many sensors. So the challenge when you work with a JSON document with embedded sub document is how do you analytics, how do you work with that? And this is where it's interesting to use a SQL engine if you want to use SQL. But in many, many companies, uh, it's, uh, it's working with uh, SQL, Tableau, ClickView, all the business uh, analytics tools. And it's, very, it's still interesting to keep SQL as an analytic tool. And it's not about, is it the best language? Is it more powerful or less powerful than MongoDB language and HBase language and Elasticsearch? So this question is not clear. The discussion is about 
uno sì però, una buona sì però. Uno sono qui. Sono i famosi segni di stessi. Con uno da casa no, sì che è. Che è il signor di tutti i tuoi famosi. Quindi il grande beneficio di SQL è che qualcuno, ogni IT guy, lo sa, ma più importante, la maggior parte dei tuoi So, what I have done is I use Drill, that is just an automatic project to do discriminative. Keep in mind that every single that I show you is going to scale. I have one single node, but you can go from one node to 2,000 nodes if you want. And Drill is a secure engine that distributes uh, query in the multiple data sources, on multiple uh, data sources. And what I do here is I, have, I query my database my tether, and also because I have this embedded structure, you see, all this sensor data into the record field, and I first transform them in a way that each of them will become a single row to be able to do some aggregation. So then, so this is an embedded query, then I have <coughs> and I calculate the speed in meter per seconds or into kilometers by hours, grouped by waste ID on cars. So in this case, this specific query, in the next one times, because the VM just uh, will go into my database with the JSON documents and do the aggregation. And if you have 20 nodes, the query will be distributed on access the database on the 20 nodes in parallel, then do the aggregations and so on. So this is for the SQL part, for the analytics part. It's only real, it's only for queries. You cannot modify it, it's only the select. With everything you want in terms of aggregation, windowing functions, and so on. For the code itself, is you have a consumer or you have a producer. The, the producer will send data on the stream. The stream is here, you see, you have the, the name of the stream here. And the code will be here. I capture the JSON object from uh, all the JSON documents that I want to send. Then I use the Kafka API that is a producer record. I will show you the package. And I just have to look at it. First, we force that to be sure that it's committed. So it's safe on the, on, on the network on the list. And if you look at the API, it's Important part about uh, big data, 
you want to do more and more stuff close to real time, like aggregation in real time. If I want, I could use a message as a code to calculate the average speed immediately instead of doing a SQL query. Or what will be the, uh, the behavior of the engine, the number of RPM based on the speed and so on, to see if the efficiency of the engine stays good. So do we use different, you have many ideas you can put alerts and so on based on specific thresholds. The most common framework we use today in the data to process the data this way is Spark. So I talk about globally no SQL or big data loop, but look at Kafka on Spark. It's so very interesting. Who is using Spark? William? Uh, it's a, to make it short, it replays the old map reviews you had in a loop that was very slow, or very, still efficient, but very slow with Spark because it's a lot faster, because a big part of the process is done in memory, in memory but also because there are many things. Many things including streaming, I will come back to this, on machine learning, that could be very interesting to do a new type of application. Since I am a little bit late, I will go very, very quickly on this. Keep in mind that Spark, you write your code in Java, in Python, in Scala, Deploy that on the cluster. You can have one node or two hundred nodes or one thousand nodes. Spark will take care of the distributions of the data, the distribution of the process, the access to the data. It doesn't store any data, it's just a processing layer. So I will I go very quickly on this. It's just the way it works because I want to show you what you can do with it. So what will happen is for example in our case you may want to directly receive the data and process them to calculate the average speed of each car, just to make it very simple. In this case, what you want, you want to be able to capture, process. For this, Spark Spinning has been built. And the way Spark Spinning is working is if we, it will connect and receive different messages from Kafka, for example, or other streams, and process the data by what we call micro-batching, micro-batch. And you have all the aggregations, calculations, saving, reading data accessible in Spark. So if we look back at, to our architecture in V2, what we can add, my plan is to add that during the summer when I'm not traveling to conferences, is to add streaming data and do some things here. Calculating the aggregation, saving the aggregation directly in the database, for example, or pushing aggregation to the screen. But we can also do machine learning, for example, to analyze, as I said, the efficiency of the engine. So at a specific RPM, the speed of the car should be this, this, and this. Let's see how it behaves. If it doesn't behave very well, I can send an alert because from a prediction point of view, I know that my engine is less efficient. We may have to do something. So, uh, Spark is done for that. And the way you integrate Spark on Kafka is this is an application. And at the top, I would say listen for the all star, all cars, so it's twins. And I configure some information, but at the end, what you will have is just for each article, every, in this case, uh, two seconds, I will receive a batch of messages that I can, I can process. So this is the way you integrate Spark on Kafka to do real-time streaming, <coughs> but also real-time processing. So, because I was talking about from that, if you want to so, so, what, um, we, learn, we learn how to stream data in real-time. I talk a little bit about storage. No SQL versus uh, distributed file system or SQL and so on. Many, the, the important part about streaming is capturing the data in real time, but it's also, it's very, very important, it's to decouple who is providing the data or who is consuming the data. Because doing that, I can just add new, um, new feature to my application without changing the existing code. And if tomorrow you want to remove this dashboard that is in D3GS and replace that with React.js and something completely new, you just add a new consumer, you can test, you can do any testing. When it's done, you shut down the, uh, the consumer of this application and you have, all, you have all the data here, you have the behavior in real time that continues to evolve, and you have many frameworks today that could directly integrate, and especially web, web uh, asynchronous web, web applications and web container that can consume the data directly from events like that. Uh, and a very important part, all my talk was about based on an example on Formula One or whatever, but you can extend that to 
could be in finance, in telcos. In finance, we use that, for example, uh, in a bank company or in American Express, we use that to capture all the transactions and do the fraud detection. So you capture all the transactions you say everything, but in real time within Spark, you look if somebody is paying that, they are using a stolen car or comparing if the car is used in two different places in the world in uh, five minutes. It doesn't make sense to be in Spain or in the US at the same time. So you have this kind of fraud detection. Uh, in retail, to do recommendation based on the clicks, based on the orders that people have uh, used. So, what I have said about screaming here, you can apply that to almost everything. If you want to learn more about screaming, I invite you to go to mapper.com ebook, slash ebook. You have this free ebook. I have video there, but this one is an 80 page. It's not related to, uh, to MAPA, just talking some example about MAPA strings, but uh, it's a very, very generic uh, book. It's very, very nice. So we have uh, two minutes for questions.
Thank you.